For a brief time in 2022, Sleepy Time, an episode of the Australian kids' TV phenomenon, Bluey, had the highest IMDb rating of any TV episode in history, bar the Breaking Bad episode Ozymandias. Then it got review bombed by irate Attack on Titan fans who pushed it all the way back to number eight. And this, kids, is why no one pays attention to IMDb anymore. In its native Australia, Bluey viewers average 11 million across all platforms, which is nearly half the population. In America, Nielsen recorded 300 million hours viewed in 2022, nearly one hour per American, and all the more remarkable as the episodes are never more than eight minutes long. If you have children under the age of 10, you have watched Bluey by now. And if you don't, you very likely have as well. So I don't intend on going over what makes the show the cultural mega tsunami that it is. Suffice to say that kids love it because it shows the world from their point of view, and parents love it because it shows the world from their point of view. Ratings for specific episodes are harder to come by, but the YouTube video for Sleepy Time currently has 12 million views, which would put it in the top 10 most viewed astronomy videos on the platform. Oh yes, I forgot to mention, Sleepy Time is an astronomy episode, in which Bingo, the younger sister of the titular Bluey, goes off to sleep and imagines herself on an apotheotic journey through the solar system, viewing it through the eyes of a god, before ultimately returning to the warmth and love of her family. It's a beautiful story, reminiscent of the work of my favorite children's author, Maurice Sendak. And given that it is arguably the single biggest cultural impact that my chosen subject has had in recent years, I thought it might be interesting to view it through that lens. Not to nitpick the things it got wrong, it is a child's dream, not a documentary, but rather to meditate on how its vision of the solar system reflects or refracts our scientific understanding. The story begins with Bingo showing herself to be a girl after my own heart, as her mother reads her a book about the solar system at bedtime. Wishing to be a big girl and sleep in her own bed, she then drifts off to sleep. The dream begins with Bingo hatching from a hollow earth in what appears to be a rush of lava yolk, while her beloved toy Floppy hatches from the moon. This plays on our common view of the moon as a lifeless, empty world, though evidence suggests it may still have a small molten core of its own. For a brief period at the turn of the 18th century, that the Earth might be hollow was a topic of sincere scientific speculation, thanks in large part to Edmund Halley. Yes, the same Edmund Halley who first predicted the return of a comet. Halley was fascinated by Earth's magnetic field, and even created the first ever map of magnetic field lines. One thing he could not fathom, however, was why the Earth's magnetic pole kept shifting its location in seemingly random ways. Today we know that it is due to eddies and swirls within Earth's spinning liquid iron core, which generates it. But Halley could not have known that. Instead, for a solution, he turned to his friend and colleague Isaac Newton, and, unknowingly, to the single greatest howler Newton ever made. Newton had determined, by modifying Kepler's third law, that he could measure the mass of a two-body system by calculating the orbit of a smaller body around a larger one. While this was good for obtaining the mass of the Sun, or Jupiter, which are ridiculously large compared to their orbiting bodies, for the Earth and the Moon, which are far larger relative to one another, separating out their specific masses is trickier. Newton attempted this by measuring the tides and their changes over the course of the month as they were shaped first by the Sun and then the Moon. To be clear, this is a perfectly valid method for determining the moon's mass. Years later, Pierre-Simon Laplace used it to obtain a far more accurate value. But he worked by the sea. Isaac Newton had never visited the sea in his life, and obtained his measurements from reports from Plymouth and the Bristol Channel, where the geography skewed his results. Ultimately, Newton obtained a value for the mass of the moon roughly double its actual mass, which meant that the moon had to be far denser than the Earth. Sir Isaac Newton has demonstrated our moon to be more solid than our Earth, wrote Halley, at a ratio of 9 to 5. Why then may we not suppose four-ninths of our Earth to be cavity? Halley envisioned a series of spheres held in space by gravity, each rotating at a unique speed and each generating its own magnetic pole. No one seriously entertained this idea, which would be disproven before the century was out, but it isn't actually far from the truth. The Earth does in fact comprise several layers, all in motion, which do generate its magnetic field. 
Returning to Bluey, the duo move on to a broken, previously hatched world. There's no overt clues as to its identity, but given its solid structure, pastel color, and the overall direction of travel, it may be Pluto. If so, that is a brutal metaphor. I wish to remind those still spicy about Pluto's demotion that the put-upon prior planet has not been scrunched up and cast into the bin. It is still very much a vibrant, fascinating world of astonishing scientific potential. The next world arrived at is a featureless blue-green gas giant that can only be Uranus, which, given that they could have chosen Neptune, you'd think they would have taken the time for one pun, but no. Bingo wraps herself in the planet's clouds and plays in its buoyant atmosphere, before a blanket toss throws her to Jupiter, which she imagines has the consistency of gel. This isn't entirely wrong. Jupiter's upper atmosphere is, well, atmosphere, of course, but the planet's overall density is roughly equivalent to that of syrup. Bingo and her sister frolic among Jupiter's bands to a glorious arrangement of Hulse Jupiter. <laughs> Until Bluey gets knocked off course by a small moon, possibly Metis, Jupiter's innermost satellite. They then leap into the great red spot, a hole that plunges them to Jupiter's tiny core. This, I admit, is the only time I got nitpicky. The Great Red Spot is an anticyclone, and actually rises above its surrounding atmosphere by about 8 kilometers. It's been compared less to a hole than to an erupting volcano of clouds, driven by heat rising from within. As for the core, well, that was an odd right angle to scientific consensus. Before the arrival of the Juno probe in 2016, Planetary scientists believe that Jupiter had either accreted around a solid core about ten times the mass of the Earth, or it collapsed like a star from the gas of the surrounding nebula, leaving no core at all. As per usual with these preconceptions, reality proved to be weirder than any of them. Juno revealed that Jupiter did have a core, but it was diffuse, its rocky material mixing with the pressurized liquid hydrogen for up to half Jupiter's radius. No one is entirely sure how this happened. Some speculate it was due to mixing during formation, while others believe it was due to that perennial savior of solar system models, a giant impact. We next see Bingo atop a tiny world, which is revealed to be one of the moons of Saturn. In a heartbreaking moment, Bingo breaks into doggy sobs as she says goodbye to Floppy, who goes to join his kin as they orbit in Saturn's rings. Needless to say, this is not accurate. But the vision of Saturn's moons is. Saturn lies at the temperate sweet spot, where ice is warm enough to remain pliable, but not too warm to remain solid. And many of its smaller moons can become spherical at sizes rocky or colder icy moons cannot. Saturn thus has the largest retinue of spherical moons in the solar system. Bingo's tears are suddenly interrupted as she is carried off at impossible speed by what I had assumed was a light beam but which numerous sources say is a comet. While slower than a light beam, comets are indeed the fastest objects in our solar system. The Great Comet of 1843, for example, traveled from beyond the orbit of Eris before coming within 120,000 kilometers, that's less than the diameter of Jupiter, of the Sun, at which point it must have been traveling at 573 kilometers per second, 19 times faster than Earth and eight times faster than the fastest spacecraft ever launched. Miraculously, it survived. We then reach the final, and most beloved, part of the story. Sitting on Mercury, with Hulst rising to a crescendo, Bingo is enveloped by the warmth of the sun, who says in her mother's voice, Remember I'll always be here for you, even if you can't see me. I love you. There is nothing scientific here, but it does harken back to a point I made in my video on Copernicus. Our conception of the sun as a maternal, providing figure is very modern, and only really dates from the 18th century, when we finally understood just how insignificant we are when set against its august presence. Everyone loves this episode, but I am sure, for those like myself, whose parents gave them science books to read as children, it must have struck a particular chord. It is a reminder that a story need not be a lecture to be scientifically true. 
comment, and subscribe. Or if you'd really like to help, check out my Patreon. Or if that's beyond your means, just tell someone else about my channel. An informed universe is a better universe.